Yes, everyone, it's time to return to my favorite running theme through my videos, Nirvana Killed My Career. It's the hardest and most abrupt cultural shift in rock history, where the entire 80s got thrown out on its ass and everyone who seemed important instantly became yesterday's news. And since I never get tired of it, I think it's finally time we look at one of grunge's most famous victims. <laughs> Vince Neil, Mick Mars, Tommy Lee, Nikki Six. Together they were Motley Crue and they kicked ass up and down the 80s. Girls, girls, girls. In a decade of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, they had the most sex, did the most drugs, and played rock and roll so massive that they became the defining band of 80s rock. Not necessarily the best band, but well, certainly not the worst, but by far the most 80s of 80s rock bands. Bon Jovi? Too clean cut. You could take them home to mom. Poison? They were about as metal as new kids on the block. Guns N' Roses? Great band, but they showed up late to the decade and they just never seemed to be having any fun. Motley Crue was the only one who brought the party but kept their dangerous edge. And for 10 years, their trajectory was nothing but up. They released their first record in 81, and by 89, they were the biggest rock group on the planet. And then... Oh, it's beautiful. Kurt Cobain arrived and Motley Crue instantly flamed out in a toxic cloud of mascara and hairspray. So here's what happened. After a long break, their first record of the 90s was 1994's Motley Crue, part of a grand tradition of defensively self-titled albums. We named this record after ourselves because it's our definitive statement. We're still relevant, damn it! We're not on the verge of collapse! Motley Crue self-titled had two major things going against it. First off, they had split with their lead singer Vince Neil in 1992 and brought in a new guy, John Karabi and with it a much different, more alt-rock sound that made them basically unrecognizable. And secondly, it was 1994. What are you guys even still doing here? Maybe without the change in lineup, they could have kept the ship steady and steered through the changing tides of rock, but instead, they wound up with an album that was too passe for casual fans, but too different to keep the diehards, and it led directly to a Spinal Tap-esque dive bomb out of arenas and into small clubs. Now you're playing some smaller places. Well, we played we played a couple smaller places to see how you know how it fit, you know, see how we liked it. Sure, Nikki. Now, despite that, there seems to be more respect for that album in hindsight, in a general sense that the problem was with the marketability, not the music. I'll admit. It's actually a pretty solid album, so despite being a massive commercial flop, I don't really consider it a true disaster. But there are two kinds of records on this show. One is the career ender that instantly marks the end of an era, and the other is when that band can see their careers already declining and desperately try to stop the skid. If given the option, I will always choose the latter. So why don't we skip ahead? Now, however, Motley Crue is back with me. After the self-titled album flop, Motley Crue rehired Vince and planned their big comeback. Yes, the band you loved in the 80s was restored. But did that mean they were going to go back to that passe 80s sound? Oh, no, no, no. Welcome. Oh, Generation Swine! Now that they had Vince back, they could bring this band into a new decade the right way. Yeah, this is the real crew, updated for the 90s. Crew in their Attitude Era. Extreme! The result was 1997's Generation Swine. That's right, a whole new generation of piggish sleaze reflected through the modern sounds of the 90s. Do you wanna scream? It's Motley Crue punk, alternative, glam, industrial. It's all of these things and more. Or more accurately, it's all of these things and much less because basically none of it works. Back in your face, such a disgrace. It's a disaster. Generation Swine turned out to be a fitting title, because only an actual pigsty full of actual swine could be as much of a mess as that album. Motley Crue tries to catch up to the 90s and gets left in the dirt. This is Train Records. Sounds on there. Industrial, techno, alternative. This is 90s crew. 
This is a scene from the Pam and Tommy miniseries that aired earlier this year. And oh, my friends, I cannot tell you how happy it makes me that there is a prestige Emmy nominated TV show that has this shitty album as a plot point. I am overjoyed that they dedicated an entire episode to Nirvana Killed My Career. <laughs> Look at him. He's so unhappy. It is kind of nuts that we're still getting Motley Crue content in 2022. Like, Tommy Lee made headlines while I was writing this episode. You don't hear shit about Def Leppard. How are these guys still as famous as they are? Well, a big reason is some pretty careful packaging. For the past three decades, Motley Crue's most important output hasn't been their records or their shows, it's their story. An all-timer episode of Behind the Music that basically made that entire show, the legendary chronicle of depravity that is their memoir, The Dirt, the film adaptation of it on Netflix a couple years ago, a good story goes a long way. And even in 1997, before they realized their biography was their most valuable resource, it was their larger-than-life personalities keeping them afloat. In this case, Tommy Lee especially. Thanks to a heavily publicized celebrity marriage and a leaked sex tape, Tommy Lee was still a household name, and the band was poised to take advantage of his high profile. And so, in January of 1997, the reunited but refashioned Motley Crue debuted, ready to kickstart some hearts. This happened at the American Music Awards, where they were reintroduced to the world by Tommy Lee's then-wife, a giant sentient hat. They got tattooed long before it was fashionable. They got pierced long before it became a trend. And they reinvented themselves with every album, refusing to be pigeonholed into any specific genre, format, or category. Yeah, what genre even are Motley Crue? It's not like they're primarily identified with one singular, decade-specific style of music. Come on. They reinvented themselves with every album, refusing to be well, pigeonholed into any Well, Pamela is lying. She's lying. And you can tell why. She's clearly been told to lay the groundwork for a radical reinvention. You know, pretend like the band was always eclectic and progressive so that this new version goes down smoother. Change is good, actually. So yeah, we're in for a pretty sudden swerve here. So get ready for the new crew with their brand new single, Shout at the Devil 97? Wait, really? Seriously? Okay, Shout at the Devil was the title track from their second album way back in 1983. It was never a single, shockingly, but it may as well have been. By 97, it was definitely the biggest song of their early years. I guess if you're gonna update a song, it'd be that one. But why do an update at all? I thought this was gonna be the new crew, you know? Is it, is it radically different? Completely reworked for the 90s? Okay, so, uh, it's exactly the same song, except they play the riff from More Human Than Human over it. Yeah. Seems like you guys are trying to sell me the same old shit with a thin veneer of 90s. Well, I'm sure that doesn't portend anything for the rest of the album. Okay, well, that's not really a single, is it? That's a warm-up. It's a, a teaser for the album, which wouldn't come out for six months. It's more of an announcement of their reunion than anything. But the circumstances behind that reunion need to be looked at. Following the failure of the self-titled record, Molly Crew got a new manager, Alan Kovac. The same guy who engineered big comebacks for Meat Loaf and Duran Duran. And Kovac had one immediate directive for the band if they wanted to save their careers. They had to get Vince back. I mean, you were successful, and then you weren't. What changed? Kovacs wasn't the only one who wanted that, that's what their label said too. And of course, that's clearly what the fans were telling them. The band initially refused and proceeded in making the next album, but morale was extremely low and the band took out their frustrations on the new guy. And the situation devolved until the band finally gave in and rehired Vince, by which point Karabi was not really too disappointed to leave. But the band did still want to continue in the direction they'd begun with Karabi, you know, darker, heavier, less 80s. And for what it's worth, they seem to be pretty sincere about it. They'd been through rehab, they were done with all the hairspray and partying. The whole chick party thing is, is not part of what we're about anymore. And if you read the backstory of their lead songwriter, Nikki Six, 
going darker and more emotional doesn't completely seem out of the question. In a lot of ways, he was a lot like Kurt Cobain. He had a similar background of abuse, homelessness, heroin addiction. Sure. So, surprisingly, or not that surprisingly, the first voice you hear on the album is Nicky's. Alright, this is the album opener, Find Myself. And immediately I can tell the difference. Crew are adapting the same way that U2 did, playing the over-the-top rock star with a heavy layer of 90s irony. That song is my opinion of what people think about us. It says, I gotta find myself some drugs. I gotta sniff myself some glue. So it's, a part of, it's like a sarcastic way of saying, okay, you win. I get it. I see what you're doing. Maybe this can work after all. I gotta find myself. I gotta find myself. No, hold up, I take it back. No, we're back to hair metal, aren't we? Boy, these two parts of the song do not work together at all. We've got Nikki Six on the mic trying to do his Marilyn Manson thing, and then once Vince comes in, he's like, I'm a sick motherfucker! I use a lot of hairspray! Like, the second he arrives, all the irony goes out the window. I don't know, it was working for me, and then it wasn't. Well, let's move on to the next one. Okay, well, after that, we get the lead single, Afraid. Like, this is the song that's really gonna introduce the world to the new crew. Great they got Vince back, huh? Man, no offense to Nine Inch Nails and every other 90s band, but I really do not miss the era of every video looking like this. Like Terry Gilliam directed a Saw movie. Okay, I guess this woman is like a giant doll, and Motley Crue is in her skirt, but not like in a sexy way. And then at the end, Larry Flint is there to be, like, the Vincent Price to her Edward Scissorhands, I guess. From the band that brought you Dr. Feelgood, here's Dr. Feel Really Gross. Okay, well, the song. Nicky wrote this about his future wife and future ex-wife, Donna Derrico from Baywatch. Apparently, at the beginning of their relationship, she was a little reluctant. So, Nicky wrote this song about her. She's so afraid to kiss. It's funny that this was his conclusion after she was nervous about dating the recovering addict, hedonist rock star who wrote such romantic ballads as Girls, Girls, Girls. Can't be me. She's just afraid of love. Is she running from her past? Afraid is by far the biggest song on the album and the only one fans seem reasonably fond of. I think this sucks. I mean, I want to be fair to this song. I don't hate it. It's more like I don't get it. Like, who is this for? What is the tone supposed to be? What's the aesthetic you're going for? It feels like no part of this works with any other part. We got like this mid-90s Metallica video with this Bon Jovi chorus and new metal bass and Aerosmith lyrics. They're still trying to do all their 80s moves like, oh look, my guitar's like a dick. Now, now, now. Even Vince's new hair color looks wrong. I guess my main issue is, what? And clearly the world agreed with me. Afraid got some rock airplay, but didn't really make very much noise, even compared to their old school peers like Van Halen. I know some crew fans still like the song, but man, it's just not good. It's a song called Generation Swine. All right, well, let's try the title track, Generation Swine. This is at least classic crew. No electronic effects or irony, just good old rock and roll. Except that title, what the hell's that supposed to mean? Because they went all in on the pig thing, as evidenced by this Primus-ass album cover. 
The name comes from a Hunter S. Thompson book, though Hunter was probably talking about a different breed of swine. You can tell that a more talented writer than Motley Crue coined that phrase. It, it, it just sounds wrong coming out of them. Swine. It's almost too classy a word for them. Sounds way better than Generation Shithead, I guess. But what does it mean exactly? Well, the label had this to say. The whole point is to make Generation Swine a statement within itself, thereby making Motley Crue a movement. A movement of what? Whether Motley Crue ever defined a generation is debatable, but if they did, it wasn't this one. I think you're only allowed to write a song about your generation while you're still a young man. Like, if there are already younger generations doing more interesting things, like, you, you need to stop. But give this to them, they were trying to keep up with the kids, and I don't think it was just trend writing. According to what they've said, they did seem genuinely interested in harder, newer stuff. And they did not have to be doing this. Like, yes, the 90s were pretty hostile to the old school hard rockers, but not as much as people remember. Aerosmith was obviously a big outlier, but also, you know, Ozzy Osbourne, ACDC, Bon Jovi, Kiss. Maybe they weren't big hit makers anymore, but they were still visible, keeping the flame alive without changing their sound very much. So, not trying to coast, staying relevant with a changing scene, I guess that's laudable, and it's certainly more ambitious than any of their peers. But the question is, if they're not going to be this, then what are they? Okay, here's the second single, Beauty. Okay, okay, got kind of a monster magnet groove going. I'm digging this. <sighs> no, wait, I take it back again. For what it's worth, I think this is the best song on the album. It's just that weird pre-chorus renders it basically incoherent. Like, at least with the self-titled album, grunge gave them a target to aim at, but Generation Swine came out in that weird, post-alternative, pre-new metal period where the dominant trend was anyone's guess. Like, what was the predominant sound in rock? Is it grunge? Alternative? Groove metal? Industrial metal? Alt metal? Brit pop? Pop punk? Ska? No one knew, least of all Motley Crue, which is why they seem to be trying to do basically all these things and failing. The album careens wildly from old school punk songs to middle of the road 90s radio alternative to heavy ass thrash metal. What are they doing? That album fucked me up. Like, it will surprise none of you that all the band members describe the recording process as miserable. Nikki and Tommy, the two band leaders, couldn't agree or decide on anything. They promoted their engineer, Scott Humphrey, to producer, and he clearly wasn't ready to call the shots and couldn't handle these big personalities. And the other two guys say they both felt really shit on during it. Every time that I would come up with a part, it was always wrong. But the most telling testimony about what went wrong comes from their temporary frontman, John Karabi, who worked on the album for a good year before getting shit canned. Here's how he describes it. They really didn't know what they wanted. Nikki would say, Manic Street Preachers and Old David Bowie. And then Scott would go, Cheap Trick. And then Tommy would go, Heavy, like Pantera, but Lush, like Oasis. And I'm trying to process her, like, how do you, how do you blend Pantera with Oasis or Cheap yeah. Trick or Bowie? That sounds right to me. I definitely hear snippets of all those bands and several others. One band I definitely thought of a couple times was Stone Temple Pilots. Like, here's a song called Flush. It sounds just like STP. The title is a random word that's not in the lyrics like a Stone Temple Pilots song. It's literally just one letter away from the title of a Stone Temple Pilots song. Okay, here's the big problem with their attempts to go alternative or industrial or whatever. Vince Neil can't do it. He's the big millstone around this album. Yes, there's a really bizarre grab bag of styles and they don't work together, but even if it did, Vince couldn't pull off any of them. And there's a reason. Most of these songs were written for John Karabi, and according to an $8 million lawsuit by Karabi. And he and Vince have completely different vocal ranges and completely different energies. 
Imagine Vince trying to sing 90s songs. I'm a creep! I'm a weirdo! Woo! Doesn't surprise me to find out that Vince wanted to be there even less than when he quit the first time. Just got back in the band, still really weren't getting along with each other. I probably quit five times throughout the making of this, this album. Didn't want to be there. Uh, but Glitter was actually a really cool song. Oh, is it Vince? Alright, well, we should check that out. Here's the final single, Glitter. And if you thought those other songs were uncrew like well, you ain't heard nothing. It's a ballad with a lot of electronic stuff going on in it. Vince says he didn't like the electronic elements. He felt like he was singing karaoke instead of with a real band. The synths do make an easy target, but honestly, I actually kind of like them. I think they're an interesting idea. My problem with the song is, is just that it's a Motley Crue ballad. Because Motley Crue's ballads blow. Yeah, they're like the one hair band who just couldn't do ballads. They have one good one, Home Sweet Home, and the rest fucking suck. Like, even worse than most hair ballads. Listen to this. Glitter was a song that was an experiment in writing with other songwriters. The other songwriter he's talking about is Brian Adams. Now nothing can take you away from me. He had to send the song to Brian fucking Adams and have him fix it. And I say this with every insult intended. I wish Brian Adams had written more of this. That line is confirmably Nicky's. Like, say what you want about Brian Adams, he at least knows what a romantic lyric is. So do any of them have anything good to say about this record? Yes, actually. Even though the recording process was miserable, Nicky and Tommy seem to have at least a couple fond memories of it. Why? Well, for one, they got to sing. With Swine, it's like, it was one of those, uh, like a band effort where like Nicky sang, uh, sang the fucking verses. It's not just the singer, you know, there's, and I like it when the focus moves around. It keeps it fun, keeps it, you know, fresh. I think it's funny that Nikki Six and Tommy Lee, who are by far the two most famous members of the band, still have lead singer envy. Okay, they got to sing. And in fact, the final song on the album was sung by Tommy. I'd like to play you something I wrote about a year and a half ago about a dream come true, man. Sure. Just like Kiss let the drummer write and sing one ballad, and it was one of their biggest hits. It can work. This one is called Brandon, a love song to his infant son. Aww. Every bad boy has a sensitive side. So let's hear this monster ballad. Brandon, I love you. Yes, she is your mom. This is a completely factual statement. Okay, maybe Vince wasn't the right singer for this kind of music, but he is at least a singer. He's the lead singer for a reason. You know, it's great that you love your kid, but man, couldn't you just make a photo album or something? You are the one, Brandon, my son. Okay, it's weird to call your kid the one, right? You're generally not supposed to do that. I mean, for one thing, they had other kids? Well, it sucks for you, number two, you're not the one. Oh, God. This is horrifically cringy, but I guess at least it's sincere. Even if it's not good, I think we can all agree that this is a very touching portrait of a wonderful, happy family. Aww. Incidentally, I have not finished the Pam and Tommy miniseries yet, so don't tell me how it ends. After this, the album was written off as a failure. 
In their book, the band blames it on their new label head, Sylvia Rohn, who they say just plain didn't like them, or rock in general, and didn't promote the record properly because the label was more focused on R&B. They started attacking her publicly, and it got really ugly, and made Nikki look like a real fucking piece of shit. <sighs> Swine indeed. Rowan was interviewed about it once, and she argued that they actually promoted Motley Crue a lot. And honestly, for a well past their prime band coming off a flop album and now promoting an even worse one, they sure seem pretty promoted to me. Like, I can find tons of PR for them from the time. Like, here they are on Letterman, on Leno, on Regis and Kathy Lee. Like, what the hell is Regis Philbin doing interviewing Motley fucking crew? I wasn't kidding when I said they sell out in minutes out of these stores. Three to six minutes, I guess, the first batch went just like that. <clears throat> like, this album debuted at number four. I don't think it got there without some massive help. And yeah, there does seem to be only one music video for it. I can only find one other video that showed up on one of their DVD collections, and it's for Shout at the Devil 97. I mean, that doesn't even really count. That's practically a bonus track. But I think it's fair that the label didn't pay for any more videos, considering the album sucked and no one liked it. Like, if they want to make the case that they were poleaxed by the label, a better case for it is that the label let them make an album this shitty. Like, something has gone very, very wrong in the recording process when Brandon makes it on the record. Labels exist to prevent things like this from happening. But the album isn't so much crappy as it is confusing. I don't get what the point of Generation Swine is. I don't get who would listen to it. I don't get what purpose it serves. I had real trouble trying to review this record because I don't even really get what it is. I can't critique its ideas because I can't identify them. All I hear is Motley Crue trying desperately to figure out what their band is without the makeup, pyro, and girls, and they just never find it. And to be fair, none of this stopped Motley Crue, who remained a humongous touring act, and during the new metal days, they toured with several younger bands, and they legitimately did seem like elder statesmen of rock. For what it's worth, their final single, Saints of Los Angeles, was actually pretty fucking awesome. To me, that song cemented their legend. A lot more than their sad attempts to lead a generation of swine. Fuck yes. The lesson Nikki Six got from Generation Swine is that no one wants anything from Motley Crue but parties and rock and roll and girls, girls, girls. You'd think he'd be stung by that, but he seems pretty fine with that. I mean, fair enough, there are worse things to be known for. Keep kicking ass, you complete swine. Seriously, I read their book. They're all awful people. Yeah.